Working? Yeah, the ones are real good. Sorry. That's it? That's it. See the gentleman up here? Oh, this one? So this is a mic, dude? That's for the video. That's, that one. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our annual Lucia lecture. Can you hear me? No? Good? Over here? Is it better? Okay. All right. For those of you who are attending the lecture for the first time, Lucia Lecture was established about uh, 20 years ago um, in honor of a late colleague at the Department of Economics and Statistics. His name is Joe Lucia. Um, Joe was loved by everybody, though I personally have never met Joe, but I hear a lot of good things about him. I hear that the students all loved his classes. And today we have Joe's wife here. Ida, do you mind standing up? Thank you. Thank you for coming, Ida. Um, in the past 20 years, we had a series of distinguished lectures. Um, we had, we, we've been honored with many, many excellent speakers. Among them, just to name a few, James Tobin, James Buchanan, Lauren Summers, Robert Schiller, Robert Barrow, and tonight we're extremely honored to have Professor Michigan here, Frederick Michigan. Um, and many of you probably already know him. Uh, he's on uh, CNBC a lot lately, uh, the debate about independence of Federal Reserve. Uh, so he's no stranger to many of you, which explains the packed house tonight. Um, his topic tonight is the Federal Reserve and the financial crisis. But before I um, <coughs> let him on the stage, I'd like to thank Victor Lee. Professor Lee is responsible in getting Dr. Mishkin here tonight. I just want to thank him uh, on behalf of the department. A uh, job well done. And I love <laughs> I would also like to thank um, Kathy Costello and Scott Dressler and uh, Louise Griffin for pulling all this together tonight. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Professor Mishkin, um, among many of the job titles he held in the past, I guess he's known as the former governor of the New York Feds. He's also been a uh, senior research uh, a uh, fellow at the FDIC Center for Banking and Research. He taught at University of Chicago, Northwestern University, Princeton University, and now at Columbia University. So without further ado, let me give you Professor Mishkin. Well, well, I have to find out where to sit on the stage. Yes, can you hear me? So uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll try to talk for maybe around a half an hour and then open the floor to questions because I'm sure there are a lot of issues that uh, you want to talk about. And so uh, and, and the first thing, that, by the way, it's a great pleasure to be here at Villanova. And I should say that uh, what we've been going through is uh, good news and bad news. And the bad news is that, of course, we've been going through the uh, financial crisis and the worst recession in the post-war period. And unfortunately for you guys, this could be a problem if you're going to go out in the job market soon. So I hope you're still not that seniors. Most of you, what, what uh, you, because it's tough. My, my daughter's going out, my daughter and son are both going out in the job market. They're having some real, real issues. 
Uh, so uh, it's, it's very tough times. The good news is, if you're a macroeconomist and a scholar, it really doesn't get better than this. <laughs> so uh, for me, you know, there's always a, 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 a bright side in, in all of this. Uh, so what I want to do first is give you a little background on what happened, and then talk about what the challenges are that, that really face policymakers, and particularly the Federal Reserve. And the first thing to point out here is that the crisis that we've gone through is actually very classic. And here's where I'm going to toot my own horn a little bit. If some of you, I don't know if you use my money and banking textbook here, I don't know if it's used here, but uh, for I don't know how many years I've had a whole discussion about financial crises. And the model that I presented there is exactly the one that describes what went on in this case. Uh, what's always different about uh, financial crises is what triggers them is always a surprise, but the basic dynamics of a financial crisis have really been the same for the last 150 years. And this one is really very classic. If you study financial development and financial crises, which is something that, that uh, uh, I've done a lot of in my career, uh, there really is not a surprise here. In fact, one of the reasons I think it's worthwhile studying financial crises is for me it's, it's like uh, sex, drugs, and rock and roll and economics. <laughs> because you get, um, you know, there's always a lot of good stuff going on and there's fraud and you know, people that you can get mad at, and uh, you learn dirty words like defalcation. <laughs> and defalcation means actually uh, uh, committing fraud. It's not what you thought. And uh, uh, so uh, let's talk a little bit about what, what went on here. And uh, for those of you who actually are familiar with my money and banking textbook, I talk a lot about the whole issue of asymmetric information problems. And that the financial system is very key to having an economy that works well. Because what it does is it solves these information problems so it can get credit to people with productive investment opportunities. Unfortunately, sometimes the financial system will seize up. It no longer can get credit to, to people who, who need it and have good investment opportunities. Lending basically comes to a halt. People can't uh, do these investments, and the economy implodes. And how bad it is depends on what the reaction is. In this case, luckily, we have not had depression, but we could have. So I'll talk a little bit about that. So what happened in this crisis? Well, in fact, when you look at the why financial crises occur, they frequently start with uh, something that's good in the long run, but actually may get messed up, which is you either have financial liberalization or you have financial innovation, new products, uh, and which eventually they figure out how to solve information problems, and that's what we call it financial development. But sometimes you don't get it quite right, and if you get bad luck when it, you don't get it right, particularly if there's a lot of liquidity flowing into the system, you may blow up the whole financial system, and that's what happened here. So in this case, if you look at what went on, the, the innovations were basically the shadow banking system, the fact that, that we've moved a lot of our extension of credit away from banks, and it's due to technology, in particular, that you can do several things. You can quantify loans to, to, uh, to people. For example, we now have credit scores, so we can actually say how, what the probability of you defaulting is by actually looking through a statistical analysis. We therefore can quantify that, then bundle a bunch of people's loans together and sell them off in securitization. And of course, the key innovation here was that that was done now for the subprime uh, mortgage market, something that was not capable of being done before. In the long run, if we don't regulate it out of existence, which could happen because there's some very stupid things that people say in Congress. So those of you who ever get the opportunity to testify in Congress, it, it, it does not uh, uh, restore your faith in the democratic system. <laughs> but on the other hand, as, it, as Churchill said, it may not be a very good system, but it's the best one you can have. So uh, you have to, to, to just uh, grin and bear it. Uh, but uh, the subprime lending and actually being able to democratize credit along the lines of, that was done in the long run will be something that will benefit the financial system and benefit people. The problem was that they didn't quite get it right. And the way they didn't get it right is something that, that, that uh, talk about in terms of textbooks, which is what we call agency problems or principal agent problems. So some of you should be familiar with this. And in that context, the problem here is the following, which is the person who's acting as the agent, so in this case, for example, the person originating the mortgage loan is not working in the same way that the long lines that the principal would like them to. So in this case, the person who has, holds the ultimate security. Now it turns out that this was a big problem not just in the subprime market, as I'll talk about, but actually through the entire financial system. But in the subprime market, you can see what happened, which is you were having somebody originate mortgages. They would go out and find somebody to make a mortgage to. But they didn't worry about the fact whether that person would pay it back or not. All they wanted to do was get their fee. So I can tell you, so a friend of his, uh, my son had a friend of his who was actually a mortgage broker. And he would, would sell a mortgage, he would uh, uh, issue a mortgage to a gorilla in heat. 
<laughs> because as long as he got his fee, he was happy. And, uh, and so what happened is that the, 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 all these people pushing mortgage, they had incentives to get as much business as possible. The result was that uh, mortgages were issued, but they actually would do things like sort of say, you know what, let me write down that your income's a lot higher than it should be, than it actually is. And so mortgage were extended to people who really weren't capable of paying them back. Who would eventually suffered? Well, the investors lost a lot of money, and also, unfortunately, the taxpayers lost a lot of money. So this problem of this agency problem was pervasive, not just in terms of subprime mortgages, but actually throughout the entire financial system. So in particular, financial engineering, a very good idea. You can create very sophisticated financial products as a result of technology. But on the other hand, if you basically can do very fancy things, but you don't worry about whether it gets pay paid back at some point in the future, you can make an extremely complicated product, a CDO, a CDO squared, CDO cubes, which in fact people don't understand, and you can sell them, you make your money, and then if they don't do very well, well, it's not your problem, it's somebody else's problem. Uh, the issue of insurance companies, AIG, remarkable. AIG had a unit which basically was, it could do the following, it could go out and issue credit, what are called credit default swaps, which are just insurance arrangements, so just like an insurance policy. You go out and you issue an insurance policy, but to a bondholder, saying that if in fact the, the uh, bond, the company that uh, issued the bond defaults, doesn't pay the, uh, the interest in principle, that the bondholder would be made whole. Well, you can issue that insurance policy. You get all the fees while it's uh, while everything's fine. But indeed, if there's a problem of tail risk of the uh, bad things happening, then it may be somebody else's problem, or actually AIG's problem, and then the taxpayer's problem. So this. The difficulty of this uh, financial innovation, which in the long run can, can uh, work very well, they didn't deal with the agency problem. They had a bad business model. So the, the, way, the way all of this finally came undone was that, that, that we had a housing bubble. A lot of it stimulated by these. They weren't going to get paid back. And in many cases, even if they were going to get paid something, they couldn't figure out how much they were going to get paid because these securities were so complicated. Once this it was revealed, the whole system says, wait a second. There's rot in the financial system. I can't figure anything out. I'm just not going to lend to anybody. And the system just stops. That's what a financial crisis is all about. We had them, by the way, every 20 years or so in the United States history. Uh, you know, so if you like history, there, there are wonderful stories about uh, these crises. Uh, and they're a lot of fun to, uh, to study. The most important <coughs> crisis that we had previous to this one was the Great Depression, okay, which is a financial crisis where the financial system stopped working when we had all these bank panics. The system imploded. And what we ended up in that case was 25% unemployment and actually very secure deflation. The price level dropped by about a quarter. So some of you may have studied that in your economics classes. So the shock that occurred, in fact, if anything, the shock that we had in, during this particular episode was actually more complicated and worse than the shock that created the Great Depression. But one question that comes up, which is, why do we have a depression? Why did the Great Depression last time and not this time? Well, if you study history, you read Friedman and Schwartz, which is something that I always recommend to my students. It it's, uh, has this wonderful chapter on, on uh, the Great Depression. And it's great because it's also telling you about a lot of politics. Politics is very important. In this case, the Federal Reserve had big fights inside it. They were very pissed off at the New York Fed because it overreached its authority. So when the New York Fed said there's a financial crisis brewing, we actually have to go in and intervene in the market to provide a lot of liquidity. The rest of the system said, we don't like New Yorkers, screw you, we're not going to let you do it. And the whole system blew up, and we had a depression. What happened in this case? Well, in this case, that didn't happen. Instead, what we saw happening was that the Federal Reserve took very aggressive actions, and very early, and by the way, I'm biased in this regard, I'm much more pro-Fed than, uh, than, than, uh, uh, than, uh, than, uh, than it might otherwise be, because I actually was part of those decisions. But uh, uh, we, the crisis started in, uh, in August of 2007. The economy actually at that time was, was both uh, booming at that time, had a lot of momentum, and we had a very high inflation. Remember, we had the oil price shock, and inflation was actually going up to a level of around 5%. So what the Fed did in that case, though, was that we actually started to aggressively ease monetary policy, even in the face of a very strong economy. And, I don't, and actually, I don't think the Fed gets enough credit for this. People complain a lot to the Fed, and we're going to talk about this. The Fed is under the worst attacks that have, have uh, occurred in the entire history of the Federal Reserve System. Uh, and we're going to talk about that, what these attacks are, why they're happening. Uh, but the Federal Reserve, very aggressive. 
What was the basic strategy of the Fed? Well, it, first of all, it lowered interest rates, but it knew that that was not going to be enough. So the strategy really was very experimental. The Federal Reserve basically started throwing things against the wall, see if they suck, to see if it could make, get the financial markets working again. Why did this happen? Well, it happened because people in the Federal Reserve, Chairman Bernanke, was in fact his paper that made him famous as an academic, was why the Great Depression occurred, and why did it occur? It occurred because of a financial crisis and the Federal Reserve didn't do anything. Uh, in fact, he gave a speech when he was a governor where, uh, in honor of uh, Milton Friedman's birthday, where he said, you know, the Federal Reserve blew it. Uh, we're not going to do it again. And sure enough, he was actually the right person to have in the Federal Reserve at that time. The, one of the things that I think was very interesting when he was appointed, a lot of people said, well, you know, it's, you know we have this uh, Ivy Tower academic. If you see Ben on uh, TV, you know, when he testifies on TV, um, he's very scholarly. He's got the beard. You know, uh, um, he now wears a suit. Uh, I, I used to serve with him uh, uh, on this panel at the New York Fed, which was an economic advisor panel, and he would come with that jacket with the uh, patches on it. You, know, you don't see too many of them anymore. I really like those. The corduroy with the... Um, my wife, I used to wear one of those jackets, and my wife called it the assistant professor outfit. <laughs> and, I, and I'm not allowed, you know, my wife now dresses me up, and this is what happens. You marry 30 years, you wear the all the time, so now you dress a lot better. Uh, so uh, what, what uh, uh, happened was that the Federal Reserve was extremely aggressive. Uh, and in fact, it did what was described by Paul Volcker as going to the very limits of its legal authority. So Paul Volcker made this statement. It was viewed as a criticism of the Federal Reserve. It wasn't a criticism at all. It was absolutely true. So I'm going to tell you a story about this. When uh, One of the things that the, that early on, which was a, one of the first sort of major hits in the crisis, was the Bear Stearns uh, 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 potential collapse. The Fed went in and actually uh, uh, used a particular clause that was, had not been used before, uh, before since the Great Depression, which said that it could actually lend to a non-bank under unusual and exigent circumstances. But it didn't really lend to, the, to Bear Stearns. What it, what it, it didn't actually lend. What it did is it bought Bear Stearns' assets. So that it, it made a deal where uh, uh, that, uh, um, uh, the J.P. Morgan uh, Chase took over Bear Stearns, the Federal Reserve took the bet, some toxic assets off the hands of, uh, of the banks so that, uh, that uh, J.P. Morgan would buy it. And it actually bought the assets. Well, we weren't allowed to buy the assets. I said to the, I had a conversation with our, our general counsel when I was at the, this is when I was in the Fed. And I said to him, you know, we bought these assets. He said, no, Governor Michigan, we did not buy those assets. I said, we bought those assets. You're going to see, I'm thinking like an economist. We bought those assets. We did not buy the assets. I said, wait a second. We get all the upside potential. And we get all the downside. That means you own the assets, right? He said, well, as a, from the economic, view, economic viewpoint, we own the assets. But actually, we made a non-recourse loan. So that's why you need lawyers. Because lawyers can figure out how you, you uh, My son is just graduating law school, so hopefully they need him uh, so he can get a job. So, uh, uh, but the Fed literally went to the legal limits of its authority. Uh, 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 and I'll talk about uh, why this happened. It got even more so over time, particularly because the, the, the Federal Reserve really did a lot of the job for the U.S. government, because the U.S. government was capable of doing it. And we're going to talk about this because it turns out this was extremely dangerous. What the, basically the chairman of the Federal Reserve's decision was, he said, on the one hand, if we don't do anything, we're going to have a, we could have a depression. If we do it, we're going to get attacked. We could lose our independence. Which way do I go? I'd rather not be president. I think that took great courage to do it. Unfortunately, there are going to be some potentially very negative consequences of this. We're seeing it played out right now in Congress. If any of you watched uh, the hearings uh, that uh, when Ben was testifying, you'll, you'll see that. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit more. But the key point here is that the Fed uh, engaged in activities which were something that it had not done really in its entire history and were unprecedented in terms of its, its central banking activities. So in particular, what did the Fed do? It was engaged in bailouts. It, it, it quote, bought these assets from, uh, from Bear Stern, bought private assets. It ended up uh, uh, making huge loans to an insurance company, AIG, when it blew up. That uh, it then also engaged in a bunch of credit programs where it was actually intervening in private credit markets. It wasn't doing the standard open market operations that we talked about in class, where it goes and buys government securities, it's actually going out and buying private securities. The Federal Reserve, for example, right now, is one of the biggest players, actually almost the only player, 
in a lot of issues of, of mortgage-backed securities. So this is really unprecedented, and it's going to be, and we'll talk about why it's creating some very, very difficult situations uh, going forward. So in any case, uh, uh, there was a realization that, that there was a problem here. Bear Stearns happened. Uh, big surprise. Uh, Bear Stearns actually was very remarkable because when you looked at Bear Stearns, it really was unprecedented in a way because there was a run on Bear Stearns in terms of uh, its debt issue, but it was not a case of where it was run. It was a run on what we call unsecured credit, like credit card credit, where they, you don't have the collateral behind it. It was actually a run on their collateralized credit, which is the thing that they thought was would never have a run on it. And the reason you didn't think it's going to be a run is if the collateral is good, you don't have to worry about it. The problem was, in a, in a financial crisis like this, if everybody has to sell the collateral all at once, it's no good anymore. And so there was a run on Bear Stearns, the Fed intervened. Uh, uh, things uh, uh, settled down, but with credit markets very severely impaired. Credit spreads had gone up quite a bit, but not to disastrous levels. And then we get to the fall of 2008, and wild things start to happen. Lehman Brothers goes under. Most people talking about this crisis really focus on Lehman Brothers. And they say that's what was the, was really caused the real severe part of this crisis. When I look at this, I actually think the Lehman Brothers was important, but much more important were two events that occurred shortly after Lehman Brothers. Lehman Brothers, in the marketplace, people knew that Lehman Brothers might go under. So everybody, everybody you talk to people in the market, they all said Lehman Brothers had huge exposure to subprime mortgages, to these securities. They already knew that they might be in trouble. Uh, and so if anybody was going to go as the next investment bank, it was going to be Lehman Brothers. Lehman Brothers finally went under, and in fact, at first the market seemed to handle it. Why did it then become the worst financial crisis since, since the Great Depression? Well, the reason was really twofold. was shortly after Lehman Brothers went under, AIG was revealed to have engaged in huge speculation in terms of these credit default swaps. That was a complete surprise to the markets. So I knew this when I was inside the Fed because once Bear Stearns occurred, we then said we had to actually now uh, realize that it was not just banks that were subject to too big to fail, but in fact other financial institutions, big investment banks. And so there was a view that in fact we would have to regulate them in a similar way to the way that we regulated banks. Indeed, uh, we never had to actually change things because they all became banks uh, during the crisis. But uh, I'm very aware that nobody inside the Fed talked about the fact that we have to worry about systemic risk occurring from the insurance company. And as Chairman <coughs> Matthew put it, he said the thing that made me most angry in this crisis was that there was an insurance company which was basically unregulated, and it had a hedge fund inside of it that basically destroyed the company and also almost brought down the entire financial system. So that was surprise one, and what it realized, revealed was it was not just a subprime problem that the rock of the agency problems I talked about were not just subprime, they were throughout the whole industry, that everybody was making a lot of money by, in fact, booking fees and creating these products, and nobody was worried about the tail risk. And if the tail risk happened, all of a sudden you were in big trouble. And that's indeed what happened. So that was number one. Number two, and very important, was the response of the government. <coughs> when you look at the history of financial crises, what you realize that financial crisis is very well described by Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who got it exactly right, when he did one of these fireside chats uh, when he first got into office, and he said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And that's exactly right. A financial crisis is where there's a, a, people lose confidence, so all the transactions that you normally do, you no longer are willing to do, the financial system stops working, and people can't get funding to, to, uh, to, uh, to make investments, whether it's purchase a house, or uh, uh, put in plant and equipment for, for, for corporations, and as a result, the system comes to a stop. So one of the key issues here is, do you have confidence that the government's going to do the right thing? Well, if you remember at that period, we were in a situation where we had a, a, a president who was a lame, not only a lame duck, but as I might view, is the worst president we've had since James Buchanan. So I don't know how much American history you still guys still know, but uh, James Buchanan was the last president before the Civil War, and he was a disaster. So, uh, uh, as a result, Bush, even though actually at that point what he suggested doing was actually quite reasonable, he had so little authority that basically his own party, the Republican Party, opposed the TARP legislation. Also, you had the Treasury Secretary bring legislation to spend $700 billion of money in a three-page three uh, document 
And one of the things that it was absolutely un-American, it said that we were not going to be accountable to anybody, in, that, in, in fact, we can't even be sued. And in this country, there's no such thing as not being able to be sued. <laughs> so, uh, so that was a, a disaster. Then, then, uh, what then transpired was that the Congress actually voted down this rescue money. Uh, and that was a very, very, uh, uh, the, the markets reacted extremely bad to that. They finally did pass it, but if you remember, they, when they passed it, they had all sorts of Christmas presents. It was exactly what we always complained about, about politics. My favorite one was that there was a subsidy for wooden toy arrows for some, uh, some uh, 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 um, archery company. And that was put in the, in the TARP legislation. So the problem here is it said to people in the markets that we can't trust that the government is going to handle this well. And that then meant that the markets just blew up completely. They, by the way, that actually was accurate. The way that the Treasury then executed the TARP uh, issues, uh, the use of TARP money, was absolutely grossly incompetent. So what they did, for example, uh, is something that we teach, I'm sure you teach it in business school, when we <coughs> have our ethics course as the, uh, for our MBAs, what do we teach them? We say, you have a fiduciary responsibility to maximize shareholder value. Isn't that what we tell our students? Well, if you're somebody who says to you, look, you're a firm that has what we call huge debt overhead. So it's very close to going bankrupt because it, it has so much debt out there that it's not clear that whether it's going to survive. And you give that firm a lot of capital. If you took our ethics course at Columbia, or whatever ethics course you teach here, you're supposed to maximize shareholder value pay out as much of it as you can to the shareholders. Well, how do you stop that? If you give them money to, 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 to bail them out and to, to uh, have them raise capital, have more capital, so they can go out and make loans, you have to put restrictions on that capital that we give them. There were none. And so as a result, uh, half of the money that was put in through TARP and these banks was paid out as dividends. So one of the problems that this created, by the way, was not only was it less effective, but it also made the American public so mad that, that uh, they say they're not going to take it anymore. And the anger is just incredible out there. And I'll tell you, I'm getting a lot of hate emails lately. You should see uh, the hate emails I've been getting lately with them defending the Fed. And uh, my favorite hate email that I got the other day was, uh, it, you know, it said, you know, uh, so it's referred to on Bloomberg Radio. Uh, uh, and then the inside it said, I have two words for you. One, torches. Two, pitchforks. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of that is a sense of humor. Some of these are scary. I get some real scary ones. But that one, I, 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 I thoroughly enjoyed that one. So that one, uh, I was going to attempt to write the person back and say, that, that was the best hate email I've gotten. <laughs> uh, so uh, so uh, the, the problem then was that so the, those parts of the events, I think, are underappreciated how important they are. Uh, the situation, by the way, uh, uh, became really a problem, and the scariest period for me was in, in March. Uh, uh, because in March of this past year, I basically said we can have a depression. And the reason was that the government had stepped in, <coughs> had these bailout funds, but it basically used them up. They were uh, uh, used in a way that had angered the public. So we were sitting in a situation in March that if another Lehman Brothers occurred, there's no way the government to allocate the money to deal with it. And that became very clear because the Obama administration said they were going to do all these things and then would, would realize they could not ask for money from Congress and, and, uh, and also was, I think, not aggressive enough in doing so. And the uh, anger in Congress was such that it probably very possibly they asked for, for, for money to actually deal with the crisis, they weren't going to get it. Once that became clear, people said all we have to do is have one bad shoe drop and the system then would implode. We wouldn't have a depression. What did go on here during this period is the Federal Reserve is doing whatever it takes. It's basically experimental. It's, it's you know, in fact, uh, when you look at this, we were there when I was there, and then afterwards it got even worse. Every uh, every three weeks we'd have a new program. There's some initials, you know, uh, PCBF, you know, a, a zillion different initials, and you felt like you were in the Pentagon fighting a war with all, all these uh, these acronyms. Uh, uh, where were we now? Well, the good news is we've avoided a depression. And I give Chairman Bernanke a huge amount of credit for this. I will also say, however, there were mistakes in terms of how uh, some of these, these experiments that the Fed was uh, pursuing. 
Uh, one, by the way, that has just infuriated people, I think rightfully, came out of the New York Fed, where uh, the, the, the Tim Guy was at, at that point, who was not the Treasury Secretary, was the head of the New York Fed, that uh, 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 Goldman actually had all these AIG credit default swaps. Uh, it valued them at like 20 cents in the dollar. The market was saying 50 cents in the dollar. They, they, they went in and they got 100 cents in the dollar from the, from the New York Fed. And, that, and, and now Goldman is paying these zillion dollar bonuses and it's got people curious. So also Goldman has no clue. At this point, we're in a very dangerous situation where in fact we have regulation which just says we're not allowing you to pay any of that out. And these guys think it's back to normal that they can just pay this money out right now uh, in a situation where the public is, is extremely, extremely upset. So where does it put the Fed? Well, here's the problem, some of the challenges. And the good news is we, 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 we uh, almost surely avoided a depression. Looks like there were not going to be any further shoes dropping. The economy started to recover. Uh, we've actually seen the unemployment rate drop. It's an extremely high level. Uh, and it may go back up again, but we basically look like we've avoided, we've dodged the bullet. We're not going to have a disaster. Uh, the financial markets have repaired uh, tremendously. Some of the credit spreads that were just uh, unbelievably large have come down to much more normal levels. They're still high. The financial system is still impaired. But we're no longer looking at <coughs> this. And that's actually one of the things the stock market's reflected, which is the stock market has basically said we're not going to have a depression. And at one point, by the way, in March, when, uh, when the Dow Jones was about under 7,000, there was a real possibility of that. So things are certainly better in that regard. The problem here is that the public is furious that there's some of the same people who went out and caused this problem are now getting rich again. And, uh, uh, and they have to blame somebody. And so let me tell you a story about my grandfather. So I call this the Mayor of Michigan problem. So my grandfather, Mayor of Michigan, came to this country. He actually walked from Russia uh, to Germany, took a boat across uh, around the turn of the century. Uh, he never really made a very good living. He was a peddler. So I this, you know, this story about grandfather. He carried stuff in his back from door to door. Eventually, actually, he owned an Army Navy store. And my father said, it was on the Lower East Side of an Army Navy store, he said, you know, he sold silk shirts to working men. And he said, and he was doing OK in 1929, stock market crash. And my grandfather says, it serves those rich bastards right. <laughs> <laughs> he lost the store. My father had to drop out of college, go to night school. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it was devastating for the, for, for the family. So we actually have a similar kind of situation here, which is that the decision that the Federal Reserve made was it was going to bail out Wall Street. Because if it did bail out Wall Street, we had the Mayor of Michigan problem. Your people are going to be mad that you bailed them out, but if you did bail them out, everybody would suffer much, much worse. And Chairman Bernanke is very, very clear. He said, never again. And that's why all these steps were measured were taken. The problem is now that uh, people are mad. And they're right to be mad about a lot of those things. Uh, and they have to find scapegoats. The Federal Reserve is now the key scapegoat, one of the key scapegoats. I find this remarkable. I said, said I've, been, I've been in the Federal Reserve system twice. I've, I've studied the monetary policy for over 30 years, and economist over 30 years. But uh, I was at the New York Fed for three years, and then I was uh, at the board for two years. Uh, so I'm not completely unbiased here. But the, the key issue here, which was thinking about uh, 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 the environment, is that these steps were taken by the Federal Reserve. Uh, they did involve bailouts, but it was basically protect the system. But people are saying it's, it's not fair. And by the way, life is not fair. So how are these attacks manifesting themselves? Well, we see that, that uh, and in fact, what's remarkable to me is when somebody like Chris Dodd gets up and says the Fed is, was a, had abysmal performance in terms of regulation, it is true that the Federal Reserve made a lot of mistakes. Indeed, Greenspan thought the shadow banking system was the great, greatest thing since sliced bread. And in fact, I did not get it right. Uh, that, uh, uh, so the Federal Reserve does have to share the blame here. But what's remarkable is the institutions that blew it up, blew up the system, were not actually regulated by the Fed. It was Bear Stearns, and, and, and Bear Stearns, AIG, and Lehman Brothers. Uh, and they were not regulated by the Fed. In fact, the SEC did a disastrous job of regulation. They should have parts of their body cut off, not the Fed. <laughs> Nobody's mentioning it. It's because the Fed actually got very tied into the Treasury. I think uh, there were whole issues about uh, the support the Fed gave to the Treasury, which I think sometimes I was a little bit disturbed about. Uh, I was glad that I was not inside the system when some of those things happened. But the bottom line is the Fed has gotten, uh, you can't 
get mad at Paulson anymore because he's not there. So who do you get mad at? You get mad at the Fed. How has it manifested itself? Well, there, there, there are two bills out right now that are very serious, both part of the financial regulatory reform. One is the Ron Paul uh, bill, which actually is now going out as an amendment to uh, the financial regulatory reform bill. And this is why I get the hate mail. I get the hate mail, I think, from the Ron Paul people. Hmm. So Ron Paul is what I would like to, uh, politely would describe as saying that he's not a mainstream person. <laughs> uh, and uh, if you notice, if you go on his website, he just published a book called End in the Fed. He'd like to go back to the gold standard because he thinks that will solve all problems. Uh, that, uh, 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 so he has very strange views. I've testified in front of him in Congress. And if you say, uh, you describe it, if you say, uh, uh, you, just, you use the word the Federal Reserve and independence, he said, that means secrecy. He said, no, it's not the same thing. So uh, he has put out a bill which says that the Fed, monetary policy activities of the Fed should be audited. And in fact, what's scary about it is it has 300 congressional co-sponsors. Uh, uh, the Obama administration and Barney Frank strongly oppose it, and yet they couldn't control it. It still got voted out of committee 46 to 23. It sounds fine. Shouldn't the Fed be audited because of accountability? The answer is yes. The GO does audits, by the way, in all the Fed's uh, financial transactions to make sure that it's not uh, uh, wasting money. Uh, and in fact, there should be congressional oversight of the Federal Reserve. The question is how it's done. The problem with the Paul bill is that it, it, just, it, it, it advocates audits of the Fed for monetary policy. And what that means is that a congressperson can sit there, let's say, on the Agriculture Committee, doesn't like that the Fed's raising rates because it hurts farmers and says to the GAO, I want you to do an audit of, what, how, of, of why the Fed's hurting the farmers. So instead of actually thinking about a process where you periodically actually go and, and, and uh, look at what the Fed does, and in fact there is a process in place but couldn't be expanded, which is the twice a year testimony the Fed has to do under the law, which was originally the Humphrey Hawkins legislation but then got the name changed. Uh, and in fact, I think that could be beefed up. So other countries have done that. That actually would make a lot of sense. But it's very clear that the Paul Amendment is purely so the politicians can go out and tell the Fed what to do by scaring them. And the reason this is so dangerous, by the way, is because it's, it's, it would do exactly the opposite of Ron Paul says what he wants to do. Ron Paul criticized the Fed because he said it's debased the currency. Well, believe me, at this particular juncture, if we put the politicians in charge of the Fed right now, we're going to have a big problem because right now we have zero interest, zero percent federal funds rate, very accommodating policy. It's there for a good reason. The economy is, is, uh, has a huge recession, a huge amount of slack. Our problem right now is not inflation. It's inflation being too low. But at some point, the Federal Reserve is going to have to take away that accommodating monetary policy. It's going to have to raise rates. And even more importantly, it's got a balance sheet which is over a trillion dollars larger than it should be and it has to, to uh, uh, get that balance sheet to go back to normal, sell off a lot of these assets, let them run off, like uh, these, these MBSs, these one and, one and a quarter trillion dollars of mortgage-backed mortgage securities. So in this context, if you basically say the Fed is going to have somebody saying to them, we want to audit you whenever you raise interest rates, the pressure will be such that the Fed will be slower to do it, and we're going to get inflation coming back in a major, major way. So it's really remarkable that, that, that they don't get this, but Ron Paul is got some special aspects to them. Uh, and, uh, 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 and so that's, that's uh, uh, one attack. And what uh, shows how dangerous it is, is how much support it has in Congress. The other is by Chris Dodd, who is, is uh, you know, from Connecticut. He's in trouble in terms of the election because he's always been very, very, um, uh, uh, gotten a lot of campaign contributions from, from the financial industry. And in fact, they got a sweetheart loan from, uh, from Countrywide, which of course would belly up and cause the tax to pay a lot of money. And uh, there's a the real issue is, was he too close? And now he's got to be a populist. Well, he's gone after the Fed and saying how terrible the Fed is. There are aspects of his bill that are very dangerous. In particular, uh, uh, we've got the Federal Reserve System in terms of the Federal Reserve banks, which have an important role because they make sure that the Federal Reserve is in contact with other parts of the country besides New York and Washington. So uh, these attacks are as severe as I've ever seen them. Um, my fear here is not that the poll bill will get passed, because it's, it's such a bad bill that, uh, that already there are senators who said they will filibuster the bill. But that there'll be a compromise, and compromise in order to get the financial regulatory reform passed, and there could be unintended consequences weaken the Federal Reserve. 
So the issue here is, do we need accountability of the Federal Reserve? Absolutely. But you need to do it in the right way. If you do it in the wrong way and weaken the institution and make it a political animal, then in fact we're going to suffer, uh, suffer tremendous, tremendously. So that's number one challenge. And it's one of the reasons why in a situation where inflation is so low, we're seeing people all worried about inflation. Because the problem is what's going to happen in the long run. So that's challenge number one. The second challenge is fiscal policy. So we, 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 one of the things that you learn in your macroeconomics course is that when you, in fact, have a very severe recession, it makes sense, actually, for the government to spend more to, in fact, uh, stabilize the economy. That's fine, but the issue is, does that mean that they're going to spend more all the time and have fiscal non-sustainability? And the problem here is not the, the, the $787 billion, $787 billion stimulus package, but that we've done it, and now people are saying, you know what, just let's keep on spending. And the projections are for the amount of debt to GDP in the United States to go from around, it was around 40% to something around 80%. That's not a big deal in a crisis of this magnitude. But on the other hand, there's no end in sight. And the discussion in Congress on this has been incredibly depressing. You see it in terms of the healthcare discussion. So I find the healthcare discussion absolutely depressing. Why? Because the Democrats have not dealt with the issue of cost containment. And the Republicans, whatever the Democrats propose, they'll oppose it, even if it's John McCain, if, even if it's the bill that they would have proposed themselves. <coughs> so uh, we're not getting serious discussion about this long run issues. What actually makes tremendous sense is during this the period was to have a, a large budget deficits now but then actually make sure that we have sustainability to our fiscal situation, particularly deal with the two gorillas in the room. There's one huge gorilla, the two-ton gorilla, and then there's the 250-pound uh, pound gorilla. The 250-pound gorilla is Social Security. Uh, and that's a big problem, by the way, because if we don't fix it, you guys aren't going to get much of it. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, there's, there was a survey that was done that, that people, more people believe that they were flying saucers than they get paid their Social Security. So <laughs> there's an issue there. Uh, but actually, Social Security is fairly easy to fix. The real nightmare is Medicare. Uh, and uh, if there's no cost containment there, it's, it's going to bankrupt the government. So the issue here is, why is that a problem? Because if, in fact, the fiscal policy is not sustainable, eventually monetary policy can't do its job. That, uh, uh, we know that, in fact, the way you get very high inflation in countries is when fiscal policy becomes non-sustainable. And we're actually facing that. The way I like to put this is, could the United States become like Argentina? <laughs> now that's very extreme, but uh, the question is, we could become more like Argentina, and that would be a very, very dangerous uh, situation, and would mean that, uh, that we have a problem, and there's actually another problem, which is if you worry that you might become like Argentina, that you actually were going to never get your fiscal policy in order, you know that there are going to be much higher future taxes, and that actually means you're going to get less stimulus out of your stimulus package. So this is some of the, again, something you hope to discuss in your economics course. You, you discuss Ricardian equivalence, which is a very extreme version of this, but some element of this is certainly a part of uh, what's going on. What is the third challenge? The third challenge is going to be regulation. Are we going to come out of this with, uh, with regulations which hamper the ability of the financial system to do its job? And in fact, one of the things that, uh, that I have a book of, uh, that I published just before I went to Fed called The Next Great Globalization, which is about financial globalization and how beneficial it can be if it's done right. Uh, and talks about when it's done wrong, we can get financial crisis and what you need to do to, to, uh, to deal with that. But in fact, we could get a lot of regulation which would actually severely hamper the efficiency of the financial system. So for example, one of the big issues that, that, uh, that is a very important one is the issue of compensation to in financial firms. Remember I talked about this agency problem that people are overlooking these fees and that's why we got a lot of the problems? Well, that was because of the compensation structure. If, in fact, your unit made a lot of money because you were selling credit default swaps, <coughs> you, in fact, got paid a lot of money. If it then went belly up, it was not your problem, it's somebody else's problem. If the firm goes broke, or the tax debt pays for it. So clearly, compensation is part of the story. <coughs> On the other hand, so what does make a lot of sense is to think that we should have prudential regulation and supervision to actually ask firms and say to firms, are you thinking about risk management when you, when you design the compensation structure? So for example, are you in a situation when you, you set up your compensation that people are not just going to try to make money today and not worry about the long run? And so there are a whole set of issues. The other hand, sitting there and saying that we should have bonuses over a certain amount, or that, mostly, that your compensation should be mostly salary, not bonuses, is just plain wacky. Because governments do not know how to set compensation. 
So we could get very bad regulation coming out of this episode. If you actually have a situation, financial crises can have, can have two, two outcomes. One is they're very damaging to the economy uh, in most all cases. But in some cases, you come out and the economy does all right. In other cases, the economy doesn't do all right. Japan, remember, you don't mind not remember if you guys are too young. But I remember that 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we just talked about Japan overtaking the United States. Nobody talks that way anymore. Japan has lost 30% of its GDP relative to the US because it did not deal with its financial crisis properly. And so we could be in a similar situation here. So there are three major challenges here. Uh, how they'll come out, some days, you know, a more optimistic mood. Uh, but actually, in general, I'm pretty pessimistic about this, uh, uh, partially because I think our Congress is so dysfunctional right now. Um, it's very partisan in ways that are very, uh, when Ted Kennedy is viewed as somebody who is a very nonpartisan person, <laughs> he died. I found this remarkable because uh, I did not consider Ted Kennedy a nonpartisan person. But actually, relative to the guys today, that was correct. So that's just telling me where we are. So why don't I now we I'll just uh, open the floor to, uh, to questions, and I'll answer and talk about anything that you'd like to talk about. Yeah, there's somebody way in the back of it. Speak very loudly. Uh, yeah. Um, are we actually taking 20 minutes right now your textbook? And uh, we also read John Taylor's book. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, how the government caused crisis. My professor asked uh, what we thought you would think of the Taylor rule. So now Actually, uh, I, I have had a lot of problems with, time, with, with John's work on this. I, I think John has, uh, has not gotten it right. Uh, and the, the problem is that John is the Taylor rule in a very mechanical way. And his, one of the things his view is the Federal Reserve, and by the way, there are certain other things he talks about which are fine, but in terms of the, uh, the Federal Reserve, he said, look, if you just uh, plug in the Taylor rule, the Federal Reserve actually uh, had uh, monetary policy was much easier than the Taylor rule indicated. And uh, the problem is the Taylor rule is not the way to think about doing monetary policy. It provides some information, something that makes sense, which is if inflation is higher, you should raise, raise interest rates and raise real interest rates. If the economy is booming, you should raise real interest rates. That actually all makes a lot of sense. The problem is that when you do monetary policy, you should be looking forward. So you don't want to ask just where you are today. So for example, this came up big time during this crisis. But according to the Taylor rule, the Fed should not have started cutting interest rates until well into 2008. The reason the Fed started cutting interest rates much earlier than that was because it said, we're fine now, but we're not going to be fine six months from now. So uh, uh, what John's pointed out in that, uh, is that he took the view that the housing boom was all due to the fact that the Federal Reserve had interest rates were too low. I just don't buy that. Uh, that uh, uh, did monetary policy contribute somewhat to it? Sure. So it's a question of degree. But was it the main cause? No, if you actually look at, at, at what went on here, there were a set of events, particularly this financial innovation, which drove uh, this housing price bubble. Uh, and also, if you look at, at uh, uh, financial prices and financial history, you find that this kind of thing happens all the time, time that people get, quote, irrationally exuberant. <laughs> and this was very, very much a case of that, uh, that happening. And actually, bad luck. The bad luck was that we had, actually, this financial innovation, which wasn't done right and massive amounts of liquidity because of something that's really been unprecedented in the world, that very poor countries have been sending money to very rich countries. So this is China, which has accumulated $2 trillion of reserves. They've actually a poor country, which uh, has a capita income maybe 20% you know, uh, of ours. They're sending money to us, whereas a rich country. Well, it has to do with the fact that the Chinese financial system is so bad that they'd rather give us low interest rate loans than keep it in China and have it really pissed away. So, uh, uh, so uh, the, to, to me, the, the real problem here was not the monetary policy, but was regulatory policy. And on that, by the way, the criticism of the Fed is, is much more germane. Although the Fed is just one of, it was almost everybody that, uh, that drew this. And in fact, what's even more remarkable to me and why uh, um, you, it's very difficult to uh, keep a straight face when you, you have to deal with uh, Congress people, is that if the Federal Reserve had tried to rein in the mortgage market uh, during its heyday, all the people now who are beating up on the Fed for letting this happen would have started screaming at the Fed is against poor people. Remember that the, the GSEs, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, were supported by the Congress because they said, we want to put everybody into home ownership. Oops. <laughs> so uh, so uh, I'm actually quite skeptical of that. I, I should tell you, John gave this talk at, at, uh, at, uh, uh, at the uh, NBR during this past summer. Uh, 
It is not well received by academic economists. Yeah? What's going to happen with regulated and shuttle banking and bringing M3 back? And, uh, well, I, I, and the CDOs market. Yeah, so I think that, that uh, uh, there is going to be something that does need to be uh, focused on, which is that one of the things that you want to focus on what's happening in credit markets in general. Uh, using the monetary aggregate still makes no sense. But in fact, if you're in a credit boom, where credit is expanding at very rapid rates, uh, and you have an asset price of a boom at the same time, you do want to get very nervous about that. And so there is going to be more focus on credit issues going forward. For, for one of the lessons we learned is that even if inflation is OK, uh, and you're having a credit boom and an asset price boom, if it collapses, you could have real problems. So in fact, this gets at the whole issue of asset price bubbles and what you should do about them. I'm uh, uh, very upset with, with the uh, lack of rigor in terms of people talking about asset bubbles. <coughs> Not all asset price bubbles are alone. But in fact, uh, first of all, it's very hard to determine whether you're in an asset price bubble because if you're that smart, then you'd be rich. Uh, and so if government officials really could always figure out where an asset price bubble is, they'd be living in much well, better circumstances than they do. Uh, but there is the following issue that most asset price bubbles are not a big problem, which is where stock prices go up and they crash, very little impact in the economy. There's some to be dealt with easily by, by, uh, by monetary policy. What is dangerous is when you get asset prices going up with a credit boom, and then when the asset prices collapse, as we have in our housing uh, bubble case, and the housing bust occur, it brought down the higher entire financial system, and then monetary policy can't fix it. So this is why different kinds of bubbles may require a very different kind of, uh, kind of, uh, of, um, of focus. And this is why we're going to see much more focus on credit avenues in the future than we did in the past. Yeah? Uh, what do you think about the Fed's leverage? If, how is the Fed leverage? What do you think about that? Well, when you leverage, do you mean just in terms of the, the expansion of the balance sheet? Uh, like their asset and capital. Well, well, that's a, okay. So the the issue is it really doesn't matter in the following sense, except politically, because the central bank, if you really think about it, the central bank is part of the government. So, for example, if the central bank go makes money, the government makes money. So actually, one of the things that the central bank should be accountable for is like on the spending, because it really does come out of taxpayer funds. Why? Because the Fed, for example, earns about forty billion dollars a year. Rate. It's actually doing very well lately. Uh, because of these credit programs, it's actually earned a lot of fees. So we're I think, $40 billion last year. It could spend some of it on worthy people like economists. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but it still spends about $2 billion and gives back $38 billion back to the Treasury. So whatever happens to the Fed's balance sheet really is a taxpayer. Uh, if there are losses on the Fed's balance sheet, it's just the same, same thing. It just means there's been losses to the, to the taxpayer. So, uh, uh, from that viewpoint, it really is very small details. There is an issue, however, if a central bank loses its capital, its negative capital, then it has some political ramifications for it. So in that sense, again, it's an issue of independence of the institution, and that's where it is. But, but from a point of view of the economic viewpoint, it really doesn't matter at all. Yeah? Does the Fed have like um, a definition regarding speculative bubbles when examining markets? No, if, if, if everybody knew what it was, so, you know what, the speculative bubble is very easy to spot after it's occurred because there's been a crash. Even then you're not sure because you're never sure that, whether, that uh, it was not a bubble and just fundamentals changed. So this is actually one of the remarkable things in economics, which is even after the fact, we can't explain the stock, why the stock market moves. I mean, before the fact, we understand why it's so hard because uh, if you could figure it out beforehand, you'd make a lot of money. But after the fact, you'd think if you go back and then figure out what, what happened in the real world and how that uh, impinged on stock prices, we can't even figure that out. So it's not actually even, even easy to say that you're sure a bubble has occurred. But, but you can spot it after the fact fairly. You know, you, can, you know when you see it because <coughs> you had a big rise in prices, they crashed. Now it looks like they were crazy prices, so therefore we can say it's a bubble. But ex ante, it's very difficult to, to, to determine it. And that, that, it's sort of obvious why. If people all knew there was a bubble, so after the fact, but this is human nature, afterwards we always think we knew what the right thing to do was. Don't you always sort of sit back and say, you know, I really understand what to do. Well, the answer is that's just not true. We always uh, um, uh, do Monday morning quarterbacking and think we know more than we actually know. If in fact people knew that there was a bubble, then what should they do? They should sell and make a lot of money. And of course, if they sold, then in fact the bubble wouldn't occur. So uh, uh, this idea that bubbles are very easy to spot is just not correct. 
There are cases, however, where you see asset prices move up, where you might actually say we're more likely to have a, a crash just because they've moved up. We know that when asset prices go up, it's, you usually have a crash much more often when, in fact, they've gone up a lot than, in fact, when they haven't gone up a lot. So in that sense, you could get more nervous about it. But again, I think that you want to then ask the cost of trying to deal with the bubble. So for example, if you uh, want to raise interest rates to deal with the bubble, that unfortunately has a lot of other effects. It actually causes the economy to tank. And so uh, we've had many episodes where central banks have tried to deal with bubbles. Classic example was the Great Depression era. 1928, 29, the Federal Reserve was very worried about bubbles. They raised interest rates. What happened? We had a stock market crash, and the outcome was not a very good one. So this is just an indication of how hard it is to deal with these issues. And one of the reasons why it's a bubble that fairly, has fairly minor effects, which is typical of most bubbles, which are not associated with credit booms, then in fact, having a central bank try to deal with them is a mistake, because it will do more harm than good. The issue that's much more of interest is what happens when you have an asset price boom and a credit boom at the same time. Now if that bursts, that can be very costly. Then you want to think that the monetary policy should be you know, doing something about that. And that's a whole other issue. Yeah, way in the back. Uh, in terms of regulation, you spoke about that. What would you, you said you weren't very uh, happy with the uh, proposal so far. What would you see? Well, actually, the proposal depends which one. So far, we really haven't seen uh, 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 the, 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 well, something we don't know. So, for example, one of the things I actually think is uh, uh, very sensible is that the Federal Reserve should not be involved in consumer regulation because it's really not a central core mission for them to politicize the institution. In fact, when I was there, I was actually on the committee that, that, uh, that managed our, our consumer regulation, and it's the one area that I could say I thought was very politicized in the Federal Reserve. So, uh, so this idea of having a separate uh, agency to look at uh, consumer regulation, I think, could make a lot of sense. But the problem is the devil's in the detail. How is it going to operate? And if the regulation is in a sensible way, so for example, we know there's certain products that, that consumers can't understand. You might want to say they shouldn't be allowed to be issued. We know the kind of disclosure. So when I was at the Federal Reserve, we were involved with credit card disclosure because anybody who had a credit card uh, uh, form, the disclosure form, first of all, if you get over 40, you can't read it because the print's so small. Uh, but it was completely incomprehensible. And in fact, one of the things that we did is consumer testing to come up with uh, uh, some disclosure, which would be all on one page, which might help consumers make better decisions. But there may be cases where uh, we have to restrict uh, products because consumers are not capable of fully making the decisions. Or we have what we call um, having an opt-out situation, where the default is if somebody wants an unusual product, they can get it, but they have to Opt, they have to opt out. The default is for not to have the product that's too complicated. So there does need to be regulation along those lines The question is how it's going to be executed. So, so far, we really don't know exactly how this is going to be done. And that's sort of the devil's going to be in the details. So we have to wait and see. The things that I find, do to find disturbing is a lot of, in the Hancock bill, people sort of say, this is occurred in France, they say we want to limit uh, uh, bonuses to be only a certain percentage of the salary. It just makes no sense to me. There are issues, by the way, if bonuses are paid to encourage, and people are encouraged to take risk. So you want to think about what the economics is. But the fact that somebody's getting paid a lot of money, Tiger Woods gets paid a lot of money, now he has some other problems with it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, this is something that, uh, I, I don't know whether it's athletes or whatever, but uh, my wife describes this problem, but uh, I won't describe it to you. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, nobody gets uh, worried about that. It's, it's, it's an issue about do we have the appropriate kind of risk management in terms of the way compensation is paid. That's a serious issue. So how this comes out, I'm not, gonna, I'm not sure yet. It's going to be very interesting. It's going to be a lot of fun to talk about in economics classes. Yeah? When do you think the best going to start raising interest rates, given the, the change in language? Okay, so I have, I have no idea. I'll tell you what, what my view is in terms of monetary policy. <laughs> which is the Federal Reserve should not raise interest rates for a very long time if the economy is evolving the way I think it's going to evolve. And why is that? Well, the reason for that is that the situation we're in is one where inflation is not too high, inflation is too low. So uh, if, in terms of thinking about what is an appropriate level of inflation, around 2% is a good number. Uh, the Federal Reserve has now does long-run projections under appropriate monetary policy, which in effect is people telling you what, what they think is the right level of inflation in the long run. 
And the number is typically around 2% in terms of the FOMC participants. That was the number that I had when I, that when I had to fill out those forms at the Fed. We are, in fact, in a situation where inflation has gone, gone below that. Uh, so our problem right now is not inflation. What about future prospects of inflation? Uh, well, if you look at the amount of slack in the economy, we have a 10% unemployment rate right now. Uh, if you, any kind of a, a projection of where the economy is going to be, we're going to have unemployment rate above 6% for, for at least three or four years. And nobody thinks that the, uh, the natural rate of unemployment is much above 6 So all of that's actually saying that our problem right now is much more worrying about inflation being too low and the economy being too weak. And in that context, having a very accommodated monetary policy makes a lot of sense. There's one wild card in all of this, which is inflation expectations. Because when you think about the, the, what the dynamic process is that drives inflation, there, and I don't know if you teach this in the class, we teach a sort of what we call a, a, a new Keynesian Phillips curve. What we say is that there are two things that really drive inflation. One is how much slack there is in the economy, but not just slack today, expected future slack. And also, very importantly, what long-run inflation expectations are. And so far, long-run inflation expectations have stayed very stable, actually, during this whole crisis. But the problem I've talked about is fiscal sustainability and Fed independence. If those don't work out well and uh, we have uh, higher inflation, higher uh, long-run inflation expectations, guess what? We could have a problem. And then it may actually be, or the Fed may be able to may have to go out and say, in order to show that we're going to keep control, we'll have to raise rates. I don't think that's going to happen. So my view right now is optimal monetary policy is to be very accommodative for a long period of time. But when, in fact, uh, 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 we're in a situation where inflation uh, projections are telling us there could be a problem, the Fed has to then move very quickly, not do gradualism and just move interest rates up slowly, but be very aggressive in order to keep inflation under control. So uh, I'm no longer on the Board of Governors, so I'm not part of the decision process. So that's my own view. Um, I'm not sure what the view is inside the system. Yeah? You mentioned that politics sometimes impedes progress in the Fed. Um, is there something specific you would change about politics right now to help the financial system? Maybe well, like, you know, there's some deep things. I, mean, I, I find the partisanship in Congress just remarkable. And I think a lot of it's through technology. I'm not a political scientist. But what happened is technology now allows us to gerrymander districts very efficiently. So uh, there's very little competition in Congress uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, between parties. The competition's all within your party for the primaries. And so what we end up having is very extreme parts of both parties and the people who tend to sit in Congress. And so that's why Ted Kennedy is considered a nonpartisan guy now. Uh, relative to what's going on. So I think that, that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, the American, uh, uh, that what we're finding is that everybody's yelling at each other because they're basically the two extremes, the middle is really not being represented. And I think that we're seeing a lot of those, uh, of, of those effects uh, in, in our system, and that really worries me. So uh, we're at a critical juncture. It's not just over this. There's just a whole lot of critical things we have to deal with. Uh, we've got to deal with, uh, uh, with a potential worldwide terrorism. How do we deal with that? Uh, um, that's a very scary thing. Um, not a scary, I just I've watched, I've watched Mad Men, which is wonderful for our age group that I grew up in, and they're talking about the Cuban Missile Crisis. So even though it's scary now, it actually was scarier then. I remember the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, but, uh, uh, but we have a whole set of issues that are really very critical to the issue about how we deal with medical care in this country over the long haul. Huge issue. Global warming is a huge issue, very, very important. Uh, uh, that, that uh, we have to deal with the whole issue about what's the appropriate way to deal with, with uh, uh, terrorism. All these issues are very big deals. I think we're at a critical juncture in history. And yet the Congress, they're, they're, they're all yelling at each other because that's where the incentives are. So one of the things I hope, you know, when we think about economics, when I first was learning economics, they said it's all about markets and everything else. Economics is all about incentives. And in fact, when I teach students, I teach MBA students, and I say to them, look, even if you don't like it, economics, you actually have to worry about incentives every day that you operate as a business person. And I said, and that's really what economics, thinking like an economist can be very helpful. And in fact, that's coming across. I, I love the Steve Levitt books because uh, uh, they're also really fun. But, but uh, what really what he's done is show people that economics is really interesting because it's about incentives. And this is about every aspect of your life. When, you know, when you go on a date, you always got to ask yourself, is this person going out with me because they, they think I'm going to give them a nice dinner or, uh, or I'm rich? Or is it going to be uh, uh, because they actually really like me? 
That's all about incentives. That's asymmetric information problems. What I teach in terms of financial crisis applies equally to how you uh, live your daily life. So uh, uh, there are a lot of issues that are uh, in terms of the incentives that, that uh, exist in terms of our system, uh, in terms of campaign finance and so forth, that are very troubling. But you know, this is a system we have, and uh, I'm certainly not going to fix it. Yeah. Just stay on the Fed board until 2014. Why did you well, I, the, uh, the main issue, for, there are two issues. One was that I was actually living away from home, and, uh, and actually we became empty nesters, and my wife and I actually liked each other. So uh, she actually hated it. I hated it. It was really funny that, uh, that uh, um, my wife's a very independent person, and, and actually now we used to only see each other in the evening, but now we actually have coffee together in the morning, so, uh, so that there was a personal issue. Another issue actually is that I, uh, my textbook, that uh, they had a rule that I was not allowed to work on my text board if I was a mem member of the board. It was a rule that was put in place for, this is unintended consequences, it was put in place because they didn't want you to make money from, from, a, uh, um, from a government position. But it, they never thought about people who were just, who already had written something and were just revising it. So in fact, uh, uh, that as soon as I came back from the board, I actually had to revise the textbook. And in the first few months, I was working around the clock and the textbook was revised. So if you're using the ninth edition, um, the reason you got that ninth edition was because I could come home. <laughs> this is the way they were designed. Uh, they're basically, their focus is on making sure that there's disclosure properly, and they're a gotcha kind of organization. They're mostly run by lawyers, uh, because the idea is uh, we want to worry about inside trading. So that's the big thing that they, you know, like this guy that they just rallied. Like, that was their, their uh, main thing that they were doing. Well, the problem was that they were, were supervising these investment banks, and they allowed them to leverage like crazy. So uh, it, it turned out that uh, this really is very relevant to the whole discussion about systemic regulation, which is that uh, who should do systemic regulation? Well, you have to somebody who's focused not on business practices, but focused on whether the overall financial system. The SEC just isn't designed that way. It's not their fault. That's, was the, you know, they were created to keep uh, securities markets fair. And that's very different than saying that you worry about uh, um, you worry about safety and soundness. The Federal Reserve's regulatory authority has always been about safety and soundness, and this is one of the reasons why uh, I've been an advocate of the Fed being a systemic regulator. And I get a lot of hate mail for that one too. Uh, so uh, uh, basically, because the Federal Reserve, uh, 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 as its nature of the only authority that can create liquidity out of thin air to deal with the financial crisis. You can't lend to people unless you know what the hell they're doing, and that means you have to have some kind of super value authority. So this is one of the reasons why the Dodd bill is such a disaster. It wants to take the Fed completely out of it. There are issues about checks and balances in the Fed, so I have no problem with that. But again, uh, if you have an uh, 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 you want institutions set up to focus on what, uh, what their main focus is and not get too diverse. So for example, one of the reasons why I believe the Fed should get out of consumer regulation is it's a completely different mindset. <laughs> that your consumer regulation is completely a, a, a different than worrying about safety and soundness. If you get too involved, and in fact, that unit was all, uh, uh, all of them were lawyers. They weren't economists. They had some economists, but very few. That was appropriate, but the problem is if you put that in an organization, the organization may not focus on what it really needs to focus on. And monetary policy is intimately linked with, linked with financial stability. So in that case, you want to focus on that. The SEC that's going to be focusing on making sure markets are fair is not going to be somebody who can, who can uh, regulate well and supervise well for safety and soundness, and they didn't. They were a disaster. Okay. Well, thank you for very